Well, joining me live is Dr. Helen Scott, or veterinarian and epidemiologist. Thank you so much for your time. The biggest biosecurity in history. You've just been to Indonesia. What are your thoughts on these new measures being implicated in Australia? Well, it's very um, timely to have uh, stronger measures on the um, on the biosecurity front for returning travellers. Um, uh, we have had strong measures in place for, for many years, in fact, for foot and mouth disease, but um, we certainly need to strengthen them at, them at the moment but just because there's a new outbreak in a country that's been free of foot and mouth disease now since the mid 80s. So there's a fully susceptible population. And so you're getting an explosive outbreak at the moment. Um, it's actually uh, reportedly managing to be contained somewhat on Bali uh, because um, they haven't they haven't got huge aggregations of, uh, of livestock. Uh, but um, in other parts of Indonesia, it's more explosive, and um, it will be a it'll be a long process to get enough vaccine there and run a very systematic vaccination campaign to um, progressively eradicate it and reduce the risk earlier. Because if foot and mouth disease is detected in Australia, there is talk of a snap lockdown for 72 hours. In your experience, what would be the ramifications of a potential 72-hour lockdown here? Oh, well, I mean, a lockdown is exactly that. And it means that um, all movement of, uh, of uh, susceptible livestock would, um, would be stopped and probably uh, in the first instance meat products as well, meat and, and other livestock products. Um, and there would be a tremendous amount of surveillance um, going on uh, rapidly to uh, find where um, the virus was and more importantly wasn't. Um, and so that progressively that um, uh, lockdown could be lifted from different areas of the country as we as we dealt with it. How long is the virus alive? We're seeing those foot bars and citrus acid, you know, bars and mats and certainly uh, implications and, and, you know, things like that being put through in the airports. What are your thoughts uh, on these procedures? Well, they certainly strengthen the, um, you know, they reduce the risk um, enormously, I think. We have had these requirements for you know, clean shoes and so on. And we there is advice, you know, uh, ordinary advice about not bringing in meat products and so on on the incoming passenger card. Um, this is a timely reminder at this time to strengthen that. Um, you know, people should be um, cleaning their shoes before they come home, but um, the message, it's hard to get those messages out when there's a distributed tourist population around the island and, and, and elsewhere. So, um, having something like that at the airport is uh, is a useful extra step. The key thing is uh, for people um, who have come back and who have been in contact with um, with any farm animals while they've been over there, not to go near a farm when they come back, as well as doing all these cleanliness steps at the airport. And describe to us for people who haven't been to Indonesia, you know, just one. Uh, animal could be roaming around. Give us an indication of, of what people might encounter when they're out and, and how easily this virus can be transmitted. Well, I think the um, uh, you saw there some of the clips of um, of um, cattle being uh, being fed in stalls, which is uh, the normal way that uh, a lot of cattle are, are raised in Indonesia. Um, they don't leave them roaming the way we would in many parts of Indonesia, but you might find them tethered um, in a place or let out and then tethered near some grass to graze for the day. So if people were doing uh, scenic walks through rice fields uh, around the or wherever, um, there is a risk, much greater risk there than if you're uh, down on the uh, on the beach at Kuta or Sanur or, or any of those other uh, tourist hotspots. So it's a question of um, staying away from uh, from potential farmland and if you see livestock, staying away from that. But it is difficult because there are um, there are livestock at the back of houses very often that are being the food, the grass is being brought to them. So there could be fairly widespread uh, contamination. Um, it's reassuring that the Indonesian authorities are jumping on it 
pretty quickly they've put in place their own movement controls for cattle within the uh, unsusceptible livestock within um, the infected districts and they've uh, stopped cattle markets um, functioning so they're trying to stop that they're also bringing in some com cattle compensation for animals that they do slaughter and i believe they have slaughtered a number of animals in um, in bali to reduce the risk short term um, that's only going to be feasible, of course, if uh, if there is satisfactory compensation and um, uh, it won't be feasible to handle the whole thing across the country as a stamping out exercise. So it's going to be a long logistic exercise to get enough vaccine and to mobilise the, the, the people and the um, cold chain to to deliver the vaccine through to the through to the um, the cattle um, and and other livestock, it is it has been done before. It was done in the late nineteen seventies and um, uh, with it with assistance from Australia. And there was a, a long campaign, several years, to um, to vaccinate uh, all the cattle in Buffalo and I think some of the goats in affected provinces. And I think there were three years of successive vaccinations in some of those areas and then um, that stopped the transmission and at that time they managed to get um, about um, 80 percent of the uh, susceptible animal vaccinated which was terrific so it can be done and yeah. uh, just take time. We're running out of time, unfortunately, but uh, I do want to ask you one more question, Doctor, and the State of the Environment report it comes out every five years, I believe, written by around 30 independent scientists revealing our nature and ecosystems are in crisis. What are some of the standouts with this latest report? Well, I think one of the standouts for me as a, um, as a veterinarian and uh, also a member of Veterinarians for Climate Action is just the amount of extra damage that's being affected on the environment due to, um, due to climate change, the succession of disasters, the pressure that's putting on species that are uh, threatened species at the moment. And of course, we have such an unenviable record of extinctions that um, that is um, is really uh, uh, making it worse. Um, the the other thing is the likelihood of more diseases that can spread. Insect-borne diseases, particularly, can spread um, through um, uh, through uh, increased um, heat and wind and and rainfall, as we've seen with Japanese encephalitis earlier this year, which spread normally in the in the Torres Strait and Cape York, it got right down to um, the Riverina and South Australia and infected both pigs and people in, in four, four um, states. So that's unheard of in Australia. We're going to see more of these disease threats coming through with climate change and um, threatening our, our um, precious animals and of course we saw the three billion animals that were killed in the um, in the black summer uh, bushfires which was just tragic yeah. well thank you so much for your time and expertise uh, dr helen scott or veterinarian and epidemiologist epidemiologist um, take care and we'll talk to you again soon thank you